It's indeed a privilege for me to be afforded the distinction of being among such esteemed and distinguished thinkers and to guide the ensuing discussions on Africana philosophy, personal transformation, and economic development. It is with great pleasure and a distinct sense of pride that I introduce you Professor Theodos Kiros, who is an Ethiopian philosopher and novelist who earned his PhD from Kent State University and is currently and currently is an associate professor of liberal arts at Berklee College of Music in Boston, where he teaches courses in philosophy of religion, ethics, Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, aesthetics, African philosophy, and philosophy of education. He is a Dubois Fellow at Harvard University and also executive producer and host of the television program, African Ascent. The focus of Professor Kiros' teaching revolves around his desire to equip musicians with a grounding in ethics, aesthetics, epistemology, which really is the theory of knowledge. He's the author of seven books and hundreds of articles. The ensuing discussions are geared to beginning the process of engagement among the general public, primarily of African descent, who may not yet have been exposed to the truth of their ancestral heritage, and who are yearning to seek knowledge and understanding that will free them from the yoke of mental subjugation. The thoughts that will be presented by will be such that each and every person who is viewing or listening to these discussions will be able to understand no matter the level of their education. For as will become evident, Africans, whether in the motherland or in the diaspora, do have the capacity to think. The um, historical grounding of how philosophy began, where it began, uh, has just been comprehensively uh, examined by those. So my addition to this discourse would have to be uh, an attempt to introduce the audience to a 17th century Ethiopian philosopher by the name of uh, Zara Yaqub. This particular philosopher apparently was asked by one of his um, students, somebody um, that he was asked to tutor very late in life uh, to write down uh, his thoughts. So he did and he produced a small treatise, I think about 28 pages long, but dense with brilliance, depth, and most particularly a description of a personal relationship with God. In that treatise, um, he contends that when he lived around the time in which he lived, Ethiopia was in deep political turmoil. The Jesuits from the north had attempted to penetrate the Ethiopian cultural scene, convinced that these Ethiopians, who were already practicing Christianity that they invented needed to be re Christianized because the idea of Christianity that these Europeans lived symbolized in their eyes uh, completion, civilization, were the kinds of um, Christian practices, rituals, and customs and traditions that the Ethiopians were practicing at the time in light of these uh, Jesuit missionaries were too barbaric, too primitive. They did not trust that Ethiopians could actually have a religious understanding of the idea of God. It is consistent with Lewis's earlier thesis that uh, Africans uh, were not uh, considered to be capable of thinking. So here then, this Ethiopian in this uh, treatise uh, presents a conversation, a daily conversation that he thought he was having with God. 
uh, through a method of thinking that he called Hatata in classical Ethiopian, a language called Ge'ez, which essentially means looking for, searching for someone who is out there but does not easily reveal itself to you. So the personal relationship that he's attempting to develop with this God takes the form of looking for, searching, actively searching with a relentless consistency, hoping and thinking that this God would listen to this language of despair and then reveal himself to him. And then at one weak human moment, he says to himself, suppose that there is no God, then it might be the case that I'm actually wasting my time to look for someone who may never reveal himself to me because it's conceivable that this God does not exist. And then he quickly blamed himself for doubting the existence of this God. And he had to pray to this God to forgive him for doubting that he might not exist. Which later um, I began comparing with a similar discussions of doubt in the so-called founder of modern philosophy by the name of Descartes. Not only was he adamant about the equality of women, but he decided against tradition at the time uh, to marry a woman who was considered to be a maid. He breaks through the feudal barriers and decides to commit his life to her. And when he was asked why he chose her, unlike most of these modern justifications that we give, which are glamorizations of the woman's body, for him it was her kindness, he says that he became attracted to. This by itself, as a statement that came from an African thinker in 17th century Ethiopian philosophy, should be hailed as the grounding of the birth of feminism. Rarely do you hear men at any point in their lives speaking about women through the lens of appreciating their moral integrity and their intellectual capacity. It is typically the body that is first singled out as the justification of why a man should be attracted to a woman. This particular philosopher chose a moral characteristic, namely kindness, to which he became attracted and which becomes the justification for him to marry her. In this sense, contrary again to the claim of Euro philosophers who think that Plato was the first feminist who allowed women into the gymnasium and uh, approved of their potentiality to become philosophers. In fact, although Zara Yaakov came much later than him, it is Zara Yaakov who justifies the meaning and the, 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 of the uh, idea of, of, of a woman in the most original ways that I could display it is this 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 the body you know and so it's getting to the point you have to show more and more body show more and more body but at what point do we start to backtrack and say no let's look at other qualities of the female other than body and the females themselves recognize that they are more than just their body so at carnival you don't have to expose yourself to the end degree in order to be able to be attractive. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one, uh, one final point that um, I would like to make for the benefit of the audience, and this is remarkable because the debate is still raging. There are those philosophers, including contemporary, uh, contemporary philosophers, some of whom are Ethiopians, who do not think that the treatise of the Rayakob was written by an Ethiopian. The Jesuits, developed a 
a fantasy about the history of these traitors and literally created a European character who apparently spoke fluent gears and then wrote the treatise ending that Zara Yaakov practically lied by contending that this is a treatise that he wrote. And some Ethiopian traitors, philosophical traitors, agreed with some of these Europeans and for quite a while spread a rumor that this particular treatise cannot possibly belong to an Ethiopian imagination because it is too rational, it is too critical. Since the African, hence the Ethiopian by definition, thinks only emotionally. Because the treatise is a relentless examination of looking for God and also critiquing other interpretations of this God, whom Zara Yaakov thought was simply irrational, some of which were Ethiopian practices themselves. And the, some Ethiopian priests during this time, whom he singled out as irrational, literally stupid interpreters of the Bible, decided to betray him, report him to the Jesuits, and then he had to put himself in exile for two years to avoid the prospects of dying in the hands of Jesuits. Those who gave him in to the Jesuits, very much some of our modern blacks now, were Ethiopians like him, who refused to accept that he is an original mind, an extraordinary mind, who is developing a remarkable interpretation of what it means to be a believer. For him to be a believer is not to simply blindly believe in that which is existent. In fact, on the contrary, God gave you this intelligence uh, in Ethiopia so that you could question yourself and question some practices that uh, you may be um, habituating yourself, uh, yourself to because you do not know. You have not sufficiently examined yourself. For him, then, philosophy is defined as an exercise in self-examination. It's something extraordinary, and this is for the young generation. Uh, assuming that you might have probably uh, have never heard of this history of resistance. Ethiopia did not only give us uh, the founder of Afro-modernity, I prefer to say the founder of modernity as a, as a matter of fact, because that attribute was given to Descartes. Um, I have made a modest attempt to take it away from Descartes and give it both to Zara Yaakov and Descartes, because historically both prevailed at the same time and articulated a vision of modernity from two different regions of the world, one from the south the other one from the north, a point that is simply dismissed as irrelevant by modern philosophers. Additionally, the same Ethiopia also gave us a spectacular example of resistance in the form of a famous battle called the Battle of Adwa, ADWA, that took place in 1896, in which the Italians, during the time that Africa was being partitioned, mm -hmm at the famous Berlin Conference of 1889. When the Italians knew that with this African nation, whose history has not been blemished by colonial penetrations, made at an attempt to colonize Ethiopia. The emperor at the time managed to gather 100,000 Ethiopian soldiers and in a matter of few hours, devastated the Italians and won the war. This is the first time in global history in which an African nation took on a European nation and successfully defeated it. You can do your own research and you will learn that this history of triumph, spectacular example of resistance, is simply not acknowledged 
in European annals of history. In the Caribbean, you know, when you talk about, oh, okay, persons from the Caribbean came from Africa or of African ancestry. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to hear nothing about Africa. You know, oh, look what's happening over in Africa. And so nobody really understands or being educated or exposed to what Africa was before it was colonized by the Europeans. And the tremendous destruction that was done in the, in the 1890s to 1900s in the entire Africa as to how they chopped it up. And the, the brutality that took place in terms of annihilating the Africans in order to get control of the resources and the impact that it has currently on Africa. And so the Ethiopians having defeated that's um, the Italy point. is of critical importance. That is the point. That was the point that I was making. Mm -hmm. And that is the point that every black person has to take seriously. This is a spectacular Ethiopian contribution to the history of blackness. Mm -hmm. This particular Ethiopian nation took on Italy with all its artilleries and in a matter of hours devastated, devastated the country. 20,000 Ethiopians, my ancestors, gave their life for black pride. This was the point I was making, and I've done uh, to, 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 to disseminate, and uh, I advise my um, Caribbean uh, students, most particularly the young generation, to read this history. It is a spectacular existence, uh, the example of black resistance, successful resistance. Mm. And Europeans have deliberately hidden this history. But because it tarnishes the self, um, 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 the, the, the self, uh, self -congr congratulatory uh, attempts on the part of Europe to have a sustained history of triumph. Ethiopia penetrated that and changed that history. It came to me yesterday. It was great revelation. I remember that uh, white woman, the nurse, mm -hmm. who gave that quiet but devastating presentation on healing mm -hmm. bodies. She was drawing out of African mythology. She was valuing medications mm -hmm. that the West had long rejected as irrelevant. So you see, appreciating your traditions, critically, as I said yesterday, because some of it is rubbish. Mm -hmm. We are humans, after all. We're not saints. We have our flaws, but our flaws have overwhelmed our strengths. And some so of these strengths, uh, for example, uh, is drawing in uh, from our own local traditions and we use appropriate medications shamelessly. I think the nurse made a compelling case for this. Mm -hmm. But, but and, and we're seeing, though, that even people are not admitting it. it. We're seeing that even within the Christianity, a lot of the traditions that have come down are really being merged and intertwined. And so we're not aware of it, or it's not brought to the fore, but it's exactly. there. And so, and so if we can begin to get people to examine that, say, wait, okay, you know what? Where did this come from? You know, you know this is part of our tradition and, and, and it works. So it's, it's, it's something that we need to, to pull out and to put forward. I think that's kind of where we, the process yeah. has to go. But if you notice, <clears throat> this doesn't necessarily include this though. When I made an attempt to make a case for the Battle of Adwa, you notice the resistance. This is an, an unnecessary resistance because this is a new knowledge that should be used to empower this generation. As I argued, this is a spectacular example of resistance that should be used as an empowering element for the agency of this generation. It gives us a mission. We have to know our histories. It's not the only example of resistance, I stand corrected. I don't know much about the Haitian Revolution, but this is a spectacular example. And it's our obligation to know it and embrace it, make it our own. It so happens that I happen to be an Ethiopian who is privy to this knowledge. And I'm speaking about it perhaps to an unnecessary length. I'd like to, to let 
And he had just talked a little bit about that because part of his teachings is teaching musicians in a really structured way how they should go about writing their lyrics and their role and responsibility. And what we're seeing here is that um, we've really got to the point where the music is fine because the music is like what you talked about in the church, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, the calypso or the soca or the dance or whatever, it's, it's, it's music that's moving. The issue really is related to the content or the lyrical content, which is now we come to the point where um, it's all about how much rum you're going to drink, how are you going to get drunk, how are you going to wild out, how are you going to push back your body and wind up, you know, or how the latest been, if it's too hot, take your top off. So we, how can we now begin to go through the process of use to get to these people because they're listening to it. So how do you get to them by the lyrical content to start that process? Okay. Well, I happen to be uh, <clears throat> very fortunate at this stage in my life to be surrounded by musicians because I teach at a music college. And what I'm noticing there, and I had uh, attempted to address the connection between meaning and uh, instrumentation through a series of invitations of guests including Berkeley's leading professors of music, a significant number of whom were blacks, in which I invited them to address the state of black music. And all of these professors agreed on one thing, namely that the content of black music is now becoming increasingly empty. The instrumentation continues to be among the best, rhythmically, harmonically, so forth and so on. But the lyrics gives the impression that young black musicians seem to have disenabled themselves to sing without using that N-word and that B-word unnecessarily. Now, when these students take courses for me, I dare them. I give them texts such as the texts of Eastern philosophy, full of insights, full of wisdom. And writing class, I ask the songwriters to take a theme or two out of this Eastern philosophy text about benevolence, about generosity about kindness, about thinking for another human being, about justice, to be content in good music. Because they have the instrumentation in command already. What they need to mediate this instrumentation is the use of words that are filled with meaning. You get tired, I tell them, of hearing songs about baby this and baby that. For how long are, uh, are you going to introduce music to this? Quartering women into badly parts. Quartering men into barbaric uh, rapists. Justifying all this lyrically. When you can take some of these quiet, calm, sages of Eastern philosophy who speak about the ego, who speak about controlling it, who speak about controlling the very desires that the 17th century philosopher Hobbes justified as a way of being. And give the world musics with lyrics that make you think. Because I always tell them, philosophy is boring. So is sociology. People can only take it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depending on how good the speaker is. Whereas music is something that you never get tired of. So, Another way of making these musical gifts useful for humankind is to mediate it through meaningful content. It doesn't necessarily have to be reduced to protest songs. Mm -hmm. That is also diminishing it because some of these protest songs, Bob Dylan included, are rather boring. It could be much more subtler than that. 
but in terms of the community and in, isn't that some of the things that we're beginning to we have lost or beginning to lose is that sense of community of people being together i mean everybody's now into the the youth into their their own personal devices you know the communities don't exist at the same level that they did you know in the past you talked about the, the villages the community and stuff so so we're losing all of that and and that's probably created some of the things that you're talking about we're going back to self instead of, of, of outwards. Context of Berkeley, having been teaching them now for 12 years, the counter response that I receive from black students when I begin raising the question of lyrics, and it's an appropriate one, is that they are trying to make a living through music, and in that there is a pressure that comes from the music industry, which sends signs of the kinds of musics that blacks should produce in order to sell. Because most of these black students that we recruit at Berkeley, and we have a terrific African American dean who just became promoted to a provost, who herself comes from a privileged background but is very religious and travels around the country and recruits these hidden geniuses from these underrepresented black neighborhoods. She brings them to work. They flourish. Then they quickly learn the tricks of the industry. And some of these tricks, unfortunately, include these uncritical decisions that they have to make sell themselves as blacks, mm -hmm. which then accounts for the selections of lyrics that are becoming popular. So it's not that these black students are not aware of what they should do, but they are wisely aware of what they must do in order to succeed. And my advice to them, of course, it's uh, the advice of uh, a hopeless man. It that I advise them to develop two kinds of portfolios while they are at Berkeley. Portfolios in which they write lyrics, produce musics that will make it in the music industry. One or two albums at most. And then portfolios that they don't show to anybody in which they express themselves deeply. So the kind of content that I try to give them from Eastern philosophy, African philosophy textbooks, these ontologies that I spoke about, will go to the second portfolio, which they might want to resort to after they graduate from Berkeley, produce one successful album. Let's forget that some of this, uh, let's, let's not forget that some of these black students have families to support. Support, yeah. yeah. We are occasionally unaware of this oh, because no. we're these uh, privileged uh, professors sitting on high towers and advising these black students what they must do and what they must not do. I make sincere efforts to empathize with their conditions, but I try at the same time to protect them from contaminating their souls and killing their creative possibilities. Hence, the importance of retaining the second portfolios to which they can return after they graduate, so that they will not suddenly find themselves incapable of creating something new, because they have been overproducing for the music industry. There is something called exhaustion. You get exhausted to play games. All of us have played games to get these positions. And I think now with, the, with the, the technology of the internet and the YouTubes and stuff, it can go there at a very cost effective way. And so even if it's not making a lot of money from record sales, which is not where the, 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 the industry is going now, a lot of it is going to performances. So even within your communities, you can get opportunities to perform. Well, uh, I think it is too heroic on our parts, I think, to single out black music and demand from it 
possibilities that it cannot deliver outside of raising fundamental critiques of dismantling the music industry and the capitalist institutions that are supporting it. It's not just these black musicians who could embark on this difficult project alone. There is a deeper, a more expansive critique of capitalism that has to proceed before we begin challenging black music. It cannot de de deliver singularly. As I said, these students have family support. For the past 20 years, I think, in a series of books, at least five of them, I've been struggling with developing an alternative vision of justice that draws out from Egypt, most particularly an old mythical, poetic uh, Egyptian uh, metaphor symbolized uh, through the presence of a, a, a woman, a feminine principle called Ma'at, uh, which had some remarkable characteristics, some of which I mentioned earlier. Benevolence, righteousness, honesty, sincerity, and truth speaking, and have uh, developed, I think, a new moral economy that I'm very proud of. Had I been a Caucasian uh, teaching at Harvard, I think my name would have become a household name. I have devoted 20 years of thinking to this. Uh, but sadly, it hasn't. And penetrating these capitalist institutions at where they are vulnerable, namely the kindergarten stage, and give an alternative vision of what it means to be a human being. That we could be kind, potentially so. That we could be just, potentially so. That we could be honest, potentially so. But that we have not been told this. But there is this possibility for us that we could be exposed to very early on, as early as the age of five so that we can develop new natures. Manufacturers, as Home used to say, new human beings. Human beings who don't just think for themselves, but think for others and think with others, and who take the challenge of justice, benevolence, seriously, and make them new habits, and then disseminate this at this crucial time when the enemy is vulnerable, at black schools in particular, for black kids to have a self-empowering self and a sense of themselves. Hence, that singing that I did about the metaphoric meaning of the Battle of Adwa, which is a history of triumph. The presence of a Zara Yaakov, the presence of a mythical poetic concept called Ma'at. All these are part and parcel of African history. This has to be taught by hook or by crook. We somehow have to disseminate this. If we are to really see change, not now, but for the future. I see my task as a seed plant. Strictly speaking, although we are accustomed to thinking that we have a global understanding of justice, this global understanding of justice is sufficiently unglobal. Why? It does not include the southern understanding of justice that comes out from Africa and other non-European nations. I devote 20 years of my life articulating an interpretation of what justice means. And I have done this for the first time by including justice as understood by the Global South. I have just been invited, for example, to give a keynote speech in Bonn in November in a symposium, a conference on global justice. A certain German thinker who, wrote, who read my work by the name of Anke, Gra Anke Granis chose me and Odero Aruka. 
as interpreters of justice from the global south, whose visions have been marginalized and never attended to, which led to someone who is organizing the conference to invite me to articulate my interpretation of justice. This interpretation of justice is going to be informed by African visions of the self. Until after we include the African presence, Southern presence, in the meaning of justice, strictly speaking, on a theoretical level, we don't even know what we are talking about. We don't know what justice is. The justice that has become globalized is the justice that is premised on the Habsian model, that has that justified selfishness and greed. The justice that I'm articulating is very critical of selfishness and greed. It gives us a new vision of what it means to a human, uh, a human being. I go after the black bourgeoisie, those who have made it, who have internalized greed and selfish. We have to change this. It has to be articulated in writing, good writing. And then push it to kindergarten, as I said. Mm -hmm. Then we can reject yes. justice. Until after we uh, create institutions that would make it possible for human beings to eat three times a day. We cannot afford to reject the necessity of articulating an understanding of justice. We simply cannot. The correct our, our, our understandings of what justice is not. The European model that we have internalized has to be critiqued. We have to check ourselves. The whole purpose behind re-articulating a global justice that embraces the contributions of the global south will logically lead to the dismantling of these institutions that are impervious to this new global justice that among other things is going to disempower them and take these monies and inheritances in their hands which have been made theirs unjustly and for the first time they will be redistributed by those who have been working to from dusk to dawn, who have been marginalized once they are given a new vision of the self. In fact, the political responsibility that he speaks of cannot help but necessarily become an outcome of this new global justice. It's going to require kicking ass. Of course, everybody knows this. And it would be useful to assess and analyze um, how did it function, how, the responsibilities, the good governance, and because those are the things that we're missing now, and we have to get back to good governance and the more responsibilities. And I'm sure a lot of what um, Fana and etc. Have, have written about, we have to start beginning to look at that in its proper perspective and holding the politicians or the political system up to having the responsibility to create the environment in which we can have this transformative change. So thank you all very much. And um, it was a pleasure having you in Antigua and safe travels back home. And I'm sure that at some point in the future, we will um, take this to another level. Pleasure, Don. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for the interview.